get back It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Justin Brook, who's one of the top traffic guys that millionaires recommend. Justin is founder of I Am Scalable that has generated billions of ad impressions and sold millions of dollars of products for their clients. Some of their clients include Snuggie, Trump University, Agora, Russell Brunson, Stansbury Research, and many more. Justin, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on the show. This is going to be a no-fluff interview, Justin. You know, when you say that, it gives me free reign to ask whatever I want. Free reign. Bring the heat. I love that. So, you know, I always like to start with a fun fact that most people don't know about you. And so there's things out there that, you know, I've, I've read, you know, like, you went to jail, which we'll talk about. You're an Altoid addict. You, when you type an emoticon, you wink strangely enough. But um, what I noticed from your videos is you have. A, <laughs> this is a, they are sponsors today. Um, <laughs> is you have a number of tattoos, and I'm just curious. I'm all, whenever I see one, I always ask what the origin is, why you got it, where it comes from. So, and you said which one. So go ahead. Which ones do you want to show us? All right. Well, now I'm going to promote your show as the one podcast I showed my boobs on. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a tattoo right here. This is uh, God and the devil with guns pointed at each other. And the devil looks like Tupac and has a tattoo on his arm, uh, the same tattoo that Tupac had on his arm. And God kind of looks like Toby Keith. A little bit (laughs) with long hair. Um, You know, that one I just kind of let the, I let the, uh, the, the artist, not the author, kind of have free reign with the drawing. I told him what I wanted. I was in a weird space of my life. I was coming out of, I would say, my, my dark days, my trouble days, and trying to figure out how do I, how do I do good? How do I, be better, you know, how do I become, uh, you know, a good man, you know, kind of thing. And so that tattoo kind of just reflected my whole view on life at that moment. And then I've got a a new, new newish one. Yeah. What's that one? One of my neck back here. Can't see it. I can't see it. What is that one? The one on my neck is, um, I'm tempted to like pick up my, my laptop and (laughs) put it around. Uh, it's, Two dragons looking at each other with uh, three symbols in the middle. And the symbols are Korean symbols for Taekwondo. Hmm. I was a red belt in Taekwondo. I've got several trophies from uh, breaking competitions and fighting and forums and all that stuff. My specialty was breaking. I am apparently good at smashing What was the craziest thing you broke? Uh, Eight inches of concrete with... Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that's enough to break. Do you have a video of that somewhere? I don't. I don't have video. It's like I would intro this whole thing with you breaking the concrete. I know, but I'll run from a wasp like super fast. Me too. Me too, for sure. (laughs) I'm like I scream like a little girl. Um, So yeah, there's Taekwondo on my neck, and then this one symbolizes my love of like advertising Mm. and copywriting. It's a quill with an ink jar, and then a stack of hundred dollar bills. Yeah. And I have, um, we'll talk about some of the copywriting. I like your, your um, I don't know if it's a, you came up with it, your philosophy or acronym for REM because I always hear the other ones out there and you, um, I've heard you talk about REM, which is a simple one, which we'll talk about too. Okay, yeah. um, and so what about the one in your other arm? You have another one. Oh, yes. Man, I should have brought this one up. My wife would slap me in the back of the head. <laughs> it's my son's name. Okay. Uh, my son's name in graffiti. This is the tattoo I'm like most ashamed of, not because it's my son's name, right. but because I told him to kind of like make it graffiti and he went with like these colorful bubbles. And then if you look here, I don't know if we'll be able to get to it, but in the D, he messed up on my tattoo. What is it? He Hopefully. had a line go right through the number and he literally said, oops. 
while doing my tattoo. <laughs> Not he, what you want to hear. He said, oops, okay, well, I can fix that. That was his words. I was like, what do you mean, oops? There's no eraser right now. It was crazy. So, um, Was that when your son was born or what? It was. It was just after my son was born. And I was looking for all my ta- – I got one on my leg too. It just stands for speed, power, and focus. That mm. was, you know martial arts days i wanted something that showed you know the one on my leg you know the pants always hide it my chest the shirt my neck so i wanted one i could hang out the car window and nowadays i'm like man that was really stupid (laughs) what's your son's name dylan oh dylan okay yeah yeah and um so why tupac why tupac saying why why tupac yeah your chest yeah (laughs) um you know, that was really just the artist. You know, he, he thought it would be funny. Um, and we thought it would be funny for my tattoo to have tattoos. <laughs> um, yeah, that's there's no, like, big reason. I mean, okay. I used to listen to Tupac. I still do. But uh, he just thought that that would be funny for Tupac to be the devil and for my tattoo to have yeah. tattoos. It's kind of, yeah, it represents different phases of your life. I like that. There should be a blog post of the pictures of your tattoo and then explanations. I do, I do have good pictures of them. Too. I like that. Um, so, I, you know, we'll get into your backstory and some of the things that we just mentioned, um, but I always like to include a quick win for the audience. On, and, you know, you're an expert on not just traffic, but the sales messages and copy behind the traffic. Can you talk about some of the top traffic networks that people need to know about. And again, like reference, you have, someone could start a whole firm based off of the free information you put out there. So you, I mean, you can <laughs> sign up for just, people who've done that, yeah, I'm sure, you know, you can s- sign up for your, you have a 202 traffic sources, um, networks that people need to check out, but what are some of the top ones that, that maybe other people are pissed that you actually put out there, other people who generate traffic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The one everybody hates that I'm talking about right now is YouTube ads and Yahoo Gemini. Mm-hmm. They're really, really good right now. And um, yeah, in the media buying industry, you know, entrepreneurs love to talk about the abundance mindset mm-hmm. until you start talking about their marketing strategies. Right, right. When you start talking about their marketing strategies, especially when you start talking about high level media buying stuff where, you know, accounts are spending hundred thousand dollars per month or per day, those guys really don't like when this stuff gets out, but I don't care. That's my business model. This is, <laughs> this is right. how I attack my customers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Yahoo Gemini really, really good right now at the time of this interview and, uh, YouTube ads is way, way under talked about Mm. probably, you know, everybody thinks that Facebook is the most targeted traffic. I would really argue. I think I could solidly debate a Facebook expert that YouTube ads can be more targeted because I could literally target down to a specific YouTube video that somebody is watching. You know, if I only wanted to run one ad on one single video, I could do that with YouTube. Or I could target a channel. I could target a whole broad set of topics. Mm -hmm. I could target a keyword. You know, there's so much you could do with YouTube ads. And the conversions off of it are way better. Mm. You know, my lead page converts about 35, 40% on Facebook. Off of YouTube ads, 70, sometimes 85%. Wow. it's nuts. It's unheard of level conversions. And I think it's because it's there's so much more engagement watching a video ad mm. than just clicking a banner or a newsfeed ad. They're already pre-framed. Yeah, yeah. So what should people know about YouTube ads? Because my initial perception, I've heard, talk to some people who do use YouTube, that you need a large budget uh, to run them. No, no, not at all, man. Uh, you know, most of most of my own personal spend, yeah, I spend three thousand dollars a month on advertising. I manage over a half million dollars a month in advertising for right. companies, and for my own personal advertising, I spend three thousand dollars a month. That's a hundred dollars a day, and that's even broke down into four uh, twenty-five dollar per day spends. Mm. Uh, I, I spend twenty five dollars per day on Facebook, twenty five dollars per day on retargeting, on YouTube, and on Twitter ads, and I'm just using that money to basically add you know fuel to my content because um, I know my market, I know how to create content yeah. that, that they like, 
And, you know, everybody always talks about, you know, oh, if I could just be ranked number one in Google, I would have, you know, like a golden ticket to money. Well, you don't have to wait for Google. You can just drive click straight to it. Right, right. So, so can, are you able to share some of the methods you're using or what are you actually doing on YouTube, which obviously translates to other, um, you know, ad platforms? Uh, you know, it's distributing my content. You know, at the at the end of my YouTube videos, there's always a call to action. And, mm -hmm. you know, one thing I think I did right and I kind of did it by accident is my YouTube at the end of my YouTube videos, it pitches a one hour video course. And I think because it's video to video, it helps the conversions mm -hmm. because this is already someone who they're already watching video. Yeah, they're already watching video. They they like the format of video. Yeah. So I, you know, just by accident, I happen to have said, you know, go opt in for this free course where you can learn a lot more. So it has that. I just gave them a three minute tip and then they can go opt in for the hour long Big Brother version. And um you know that's what I do, but my my ad is not an ad. It's not a pitch for the content. It's a it's a full lesson. You know, I may be talking about Google AdWords or lead gen or increasing conversions. It's a three to five minute educational lesson. At the end, I say, hey, if you like this tip, I've got you know a Big Brother version. Go here. Right, right. So, what are some mistakes that people should watch out for when using YouTube? Because I'm sure you've done a lot of testing and you figured this stuff out, but there are mistakes that people may make. Yeah, the mistakes are, you know, I'll just tell you my own, you know, I'll just yeah. list off my own mistakes here. One of the mistakes I made is the only way to get to my lead magnet or, you know, my ethical bribe, whatever everybody wants to call it, yeah. is you have to click on, yeah. a, on, a, on, the, on the video. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow, that would be amazing. Well, if you're on YouTube, that's amazing because you can just click on the video. If you're on a mobile phone... Or, you know, I watch most of my YouTube videos on my Roku box out in the living room mm -hmm. or on an Xbox. <laughs> you go up to the TV screen. and Yeah. No. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, just click below. And then you're screaming at the TV you're like, hey, idiot, I can't click. Uh, so that was me. Yeah, I'm mm. the uh, hey, idiot. Um, so don't do that. Make sure there's a call to action at the bottom. You have some sort of memorable URL. If I would do it over again, and I should, but there's so there's over 100 videos I'd have to redo this on, I would do like, you know, go to imscalable.com forward slash gift or forward slash free mm. course or something like that, as well as a clickable button. That way people who are on desktop on YouTube, yeah. you know, so that was a big one. And then another one I j just dawned on me today for so long, I've been making fun of companies who start their YouTube ads with this like fancy introduction of their video. You have five seconds before that skip ad button comes up. I just realized, I think it was yesterday, that my introduction is eight seconds long on all of my videos. So how my videos have done so well, I don't know. Good content. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I guess, you know, good headline, whatever. But yeah, if I could redo it, I would make sure that, you know, first five seconds of the video has to be good. And don't do cheesy things like don't skip that button because the first thing people do is skip the button. Um, so would you take out the intro altogether if you redid them? I would. Just go yeah. straight into the content. Yeah. Or if you know how to use the Zignaric effect or pattern interrupts or something like that. Like I have one VSL that I wrote for a client and the first line is, they called it zombie disease. How are you not going to continue watching that video right. at least for another 30 seconds? <laughs> you know, so that's what I mean by like a pattern interrupt or right. a Zignaric effect. So if you know how to do a strong hook like that, that's the best thing to start at the beginning of your video. Otherwise, just go right into the content. Yeah, yeah. So what about, and if there are any video people watching this and you want to get in Justin's good graces, you know, offer to redo all the videos, take out the intro and everything, oh, you know, God, tweet them. Um, yeah. There may be a few people I know, so I'll message them for you. Um, <laughs> so what about Yahoo Gemini? What should people know about that? Uh, Yahoo Gemini... Um, couple of biggest things actually on my fan page today that was like my post you know yeah top, i retweeted and i tips. sent someone direct who i know will oh, yeah, really like it, it. um i yeah. i linked them to it so it's really yeah thanks so you know uh, a couple of those tips that were on there it's very ctr driven 
So you want to make sure that your CTR is over, you know, 0.5 percent or higher. Mm -hmm. um, anything below that, you're probably going to end up. You're, you're going to think that it's very expensive because your click costs are going to be like 80 cents, a dollar twenty. But if you can get over that 0.5 percent, you can get into the, you know, your click prices in the teens and in the mm -hmm. 20s, which is very good. Um, so, and then the other thing you have to understand about Yahoo is. I don't know how this is going to work out for them in the long run, but they're trying to give the user very little options on the front end and just their their algorithm mm -hmm. do all the optimization on mm -hmm. the back end mm -hmm. for them. So it's easier for agency. users? Does that make it easier for users? Easier for users. Easier for the average user, but yeah. me as an agency guy in like doing this for eight years – I want the control. I want right. all the little buttons and the checkboxes. I hate the idea of like yeah. some other software is just going to yeah. do my job for me, but I probably need to get you know comfortable with that feeling. Um, no, so I agree because when, whenever you're doing your ad campaigns, you're probably making those small tweaks that are making a big difference. So if you don't have the control on that, there could be an issue. It does, you know, but on the back end, you know, their algorithm, you know, I mean, these guys are smart. They know how to make these algorithms. They know how to make these changes. So knowing that there's an algorithm back there that's helping to optimize, uh, that means you really, really don't want to be pausing your ads because every time you pause your ads, it pulls it out of line and stops that algorithm. Mm. And then when you start the ad back up, it has to go back through that ramping up process. So instead of pausing, reduce your, your CPC bid or reduce your daily budget, but try not to ever pause your ads. And unfortunately, if you run out of daily budget, that's technically pausing your ads too. Mm. So... I got gotcha. you. That's a hard one, though. You know, we'll all, you know, most of us will just have to deal with that because yeah. not all of us have enough money. We can just make sure it's running. You can't just have it continuously going, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, but for those of you with big budgets out there, know that you should probably, you know, come in swinging big at like a thousand dollars a day or more. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, just you know, do your ten, fifty, a hundred dollars a day, whatever you can afford. Yeah. So, Justin, where first of all, where can people find the two hundred and two traffic networks? If they want to download it, is there a certain page that we can send people to? to Actually, check it out? I, you know, right now it's on the bottom of every one of my blog posts. Okay. So they so can I'm just go just, to imscalable.com backslash blog or something and, right, and yeah. check it out. And um, as they scroll down, they'll see it. Yeah, the reason I ask that because you do such a good job targeting. Like there's one that would only target that one. So I had to click and download that. And then I had to go and there is your million dollar, your million, you know, drive a million clicks. clicks. So you, that was not even on that. That was a separate post that relates to obviously that. Yeah. So um, regarding to the 202 traffic, what was one or two that you put on there that you almost hesitated because you didn't want to give away that secret sauce? Oh, you know, the one I hate to talk about is mediatraffic.com. And I don't, you know, I, I don't hate to talk about these because I'm afraid somebody's going to steal my source or anything like that. Right. What I hate is that when I talk about these things, the size of my audience has been a blessing. You know, so I'm not complaining that I have too many fans. You know, I love it. I no love one's going to cry for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nobody's going to cry for me. Uh, but you know, with that means that there's also a lot of beginners. And so hmm. you get guys who go on there and they kind of ruin it because they break a lot of rules because they don't take the time to read the rules or to, you know, put it in effort. And mm -hmm. so that's what I hate is usually when I talk about a certain method, uh, it sends over a lot of people who kind of, you know, make it tougher for the rest right. of us. So what's uh, the rules people break on there? You know, putting red borders on your ads, ugly, weird images, hypey claims, thinking that you need to trick the user uh, into buying from you. You know, it's, you don't have to trick a user to click an ad. People right. will click an ad, you know. Right. My uncle doesn't believe that people will click an ad. He thinks I'm crazy and I'm in the most, you know, the worst industry ever. Um, but, Yes, people will actually click an ad if you give them something that they want to click the ad for. You don't need to trick them. Yeah. So that's kind of what people do. They go mm -hmm. in there, they you know just make ugly ads or they make tricky ads, hypey ads, and, and that ruins things. Mm -hmm. um, but MediaTraffic.com is a CPV text ad network 
with really high quality that most people don't talk about and yeah. so there's a reason for it. They, yeah. you know, we, we like to leave some safe havens. So what's another one on the 202, uh, with the 202 another, traffic sites? Another one that I'm really watching right now, I haven't used yet, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm super excited about, I'm looking for a client who wants to jump on there, is AOL1. You say AOL, I mean, that's hilarious. So I know, yeah. right? Yeah, it's crazy. But now all of a sudden, they're like the biggest tech company in the world again. Wow. Uh, they recently merged uh, or were bought by Verizon. I don't know the mm. specifics of that deal. But just yesterday, they announced that Microsoft gave them all of their inventory. So wow. if you want to advertise on Skype, Xbox, mm. MSN, homepage, cool. any of Microsoft properties, that's all controlled by AOL now. So AOL, Microsoft, and Verizon all in cahoots together. That's gigantic. You know, take that Facebook kind of. You know? <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, you also mentioned in another site about, let's say it's a beginner and they want to, or let's say you just want to get data. Where mm -hmm. should people go just to get the cheapest traffic just to get some data. Um, you know, probably, I mean, there's CPV, you know, so you go to, with a company like, like Traffic Vance, but, you know, they have a thousand dollar minimum spend and you got to get vouched for. So, you know, maybe like a direct CPV.com or leadimpact.com. You know, lead, lead impact is probably a good one. You know, that or um, maybe like, uh, what are they called? Oh, I can't remember their name right now. Anyways, is lead it on impact. the list? The two, the two hundred two. Yeah, yeah, it'll be on there. Yeah. Um, I like how you put it as a Google spreadsheet so that you can ch not worry about updating. You know, things change, right. which it does change in the traffic world. You can just easily update it. Yeah, I, I, I gotta update it. I haven't yeah. updated it in well, a little while. That's but that was the fault. problem. You know, like you have a thing. Email me if anything needs to change or update. So, right. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when it first started, it was just a PDF. And then things would update, and I'd have to go remake that whole thing. Yeah, so that's when I made it the Google yeah. thing. Yeah, I oh. noticed that very smart. Yes. Um, so, so you mentioned one for advanced, and then for beginners too, they can get some you know data by driving traffic. And what is, you know, one is the the secret source of the best buying keywords. You know, you're trying to everyone's trying to find the best buying keywords. What are some that maybe surprised you out there for different niches? Oh man. Uh the one that surprised me the most. I know that there are some out there. I mm -hmm. just haven't, you know, I don't they're not mm -hmm. on the top of my head, but I mean just to tell you the best buying keywords. Yeah, you know, your product name, your your domain name, your competitor's domain name. Mhm. Mm your competitor's product name, um, phrases that you mention on your sales page, you know, those types of things people are Googling because they don't know what lead magnet means, you know? And so you're sitting there, you know, talking about, oh, we're the best lead magnet software. Mm. And <laughs> industry <laughs> terms. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. So those are usually the best stuff. And then obviously like, you know, buy email, you know, service, best email service. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, those are always just very easy, yeah. very, you know, like money being left on the table. Man, I just can't Like, think I know that you, like, going back and I read the case studies, which people should get the green coffee dentist in the Sinoplex one. What about, is there like a weight loss best buying keyword that surprised you? Because it's such a competitive niche I would think they're all discovered by now but I'm, I'm curious if you know or the the sinus one was there an interesting one that you discovered with the sinus one that was a best buying keyword yeah it was like a weight loss powder or mm. it's amazing what people are searching for that they think will help them lose weight powders patches gum it's it's, it's kind of sad to be honest you know um 
you know, I don't have the shocking ones on the top no. of my mind, man. But I, I know there's a million. Yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. I, I can look them up, and you know, we can I was just curious. You know, some of the be- you know, that's what people are really, even though they're not maybe asking the question or thinking about it, they're really just looking for whatever people are buying and thinking of in the best buying keywords. I'll you tell know? you on Facebook, one of the best uh, interests, the target for weight loss, mm-hmm. Diet Coke. Really, that's. Smart. If it's a forty-five-year-old plus woman drinking Diet Coke, I promise you, she is has a weight loss issue. Anyone could stop right here. They just got their money's worth off of that one thing. So, Um, so I want you to talk about profit is the symptom because I know you have a lot to say about that. Yes. So, you know, let let me start off by saying. I'm a businessman. I know that the number one thing a business is supposed to do is acquire and nurture customers. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make money, generate sales so that we can hire new people, so that we can add value to the world. I get it. We got to make money. Okay. We're on the same page there. Yes. However, I believe that we have brought this planet to its knees by focusing on just the money side, on the the capitalism. I consider myself a capitalist. I like capitalism. However, I think we've taken it a little bit too far to where we're completely ignoring uh, humanity's needs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Um, We're creating a planet that is trying to kill us right now, all in search of this this profit. Mm. Profit is a symptom. You know, I've done a lot of reading into how money works and how how a conversion works. Money trades hands when value is generated. Yeah. That's it. You know, so if you create value for someone, they want to obtain that value so they will give you money for that value. So that means that you if you focus on the value first, you will get the money. Money mm-hmm. will just happen naturally. It's a symptom of value. Right. So we don't need to focus on the money. We need to focus on the value and the money will come. Yeah. And that's why I'm able to spend just $3,000 a month on my own advertising and I'm literally sold out. I couldn't take on another consulting or service client if I wanted to right now. Uh, it, it's because I use that money to spread the value and then all of a sudden people want to give me their money. Right. So, so how should people, how did you change your approach once you this really solidified in your mind, how did you change what you were doing and what should other people do? Yeah. So I discovered native advertising kind of by accident. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, I was just like everybody else, uh, you know, consider myself an proudly aggressive direct response marketer and, uh, advertising from an ad to a sales page, just like everybody else. You know, I want to make sales just like everybody else. And I started to realize that these sales pages, they burn out after a while. You know, if you get good at traffic, that that actually becomes a problem is your sales pages and your offers start to fatigue. You, you get too many customers. And so you have to write a new promotion. Uh, you can sell the same product. You just have to write a new sales letter and sell it from a different angle. I got tired of writing sales letters over and over again. So I was like, you know, I could spit out a new article and then I can make the article kind of lead into the sales letter as kind of a multi-step thing because I used to write and I still believe that multi-stage sales letters are the best thing. Um, Whole other conversation, but Google multi-step sales letter. Um, And so I just started writing articles and the first one obviously bombed, you know, but I did 10 of them. And two of them were like, oh, my gosh, I have something here. And now I've got a stable of seven, eight different articles that just Mm -hmm. like clockwork. They bring in customers for me. And so that's how I discovered native advertising, content amplification, Mm -hmm. uh, whatever everybody's calling it now. Right. And so that's that's what changed. I stopped driving to a sales page and Mm -hmm. I started driving to articles and it dawned on me then wow, they're buying from me. Well, what I really noticed is I started getting, you know, those articles that I was driving traffic to were ranking higher in SEO. They were getting shared more, mm-hmm. more comments, more new subscribers, more sales. I was getting everything I had ever wanted just by driving traffic to these video, to these articles or videos. And then as I started learning more about money, 
that's when it dawned on me that it's mm-hmm. like it's because I'm focusing on the value first that mm-hmm. all of this stuff is happening. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, for people's articles are pretty much pure content. Yeah, it's, I you know, I think anybody who's creating an advertorial that is not an actually ed- entertaining or educational piece, you might as well have just be, been using a banner ad because it's really no different. It's just bigger. Yeah. So when did that light bulb go on? Did you see it some the native advertising somewhere else? Did you see someone else doing it? What kind of sparked you to first try it? Um. You know, I got tired of laziness. <laughs> that's what that's what sparked a lot of my stuff. I, I got tired of rewriting sales letters um, for my promotions for my own products, and so I started doing articles. And I started seeing some other people doing it. They started calling it native advertising, content amplification, yeah. and I was like, "Yeah, this stuff actually works, guys. I've been doing it for a while." And, uh, you know, once I kind of realized what I was doing and that it was working, I kind of focused on it and tried to master it and move my sidebar to the left, to the right and test all different types of layouts and everything. And, um, uh, that's kind of how it happened for me. Yeah. Yeah. And Justin, there is a video that you clipped on your YouTube of the founder of unbound that I remember. And basically it's just him saying, asking, do you have a sales team? And he's saying, no, I just have tons of people creating content. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's exactly what you're you're talking about. Absolutely, that was a great video. That was yeah. fun. Yeah, it got like no views, but it's like my favorite video. Yeah, you know, there's one someone putting on makeup who got like five million views, and then your views on you know on Unbound got like you know hundred views, but that's their loss, you know. So yeah. it's fine. Um, so I want to get to uh, the growing up, you know, the mm. influence from growing up, where you grew up, um, and I have written down in my notes. Uh, former Boy Scout and kid who was bullied from being a nerd to wind up in jail at 18 years old. So start off former, <laughs> early on, Boy Scout days, model citizen days. Yeah. Basically, I was a nerd that got pissed off for a little while, you know. Go back um, to the nerd days, though. You know, I know you you mentioned that you like Magic the Gathering. Like, where did your influence from early on come? So my parents moved me to Philadelphia, like, I think when I was five. And so I grew up up north. And up north, you know, education is treated a lot differently than in the south. And Where'd you so move from? I moved from Florida. Florida, okay. That's where you are to, now. To, yeah, to yeah. Philadelphia. And uh, so the education was different up there. The neighborhood was different up there. And so I just got into, you know, things like reading, um, comic books, uh, you know, collectible card games. And then when I came back down to Florida, they moved back down when I was around 10. Mm. You know, we were already doing long division when they were just introducing multiplication down here in Florida. Mm. So instantly I'm a nerd, you know, because I, I knew other things. Yeah, I could do multiplication faster than anybody else in the classroom and I'm horrible at math. So don't think that that was anything special. It was just a different, you know, education but um you know the education system quickly caught up with me and everybody else was doing long long division and so that kind of put me as an outcast i jumped into a school halfway through the year that's tough too yeah i was from philadelphia i was the teacher's pet because you know i just was smarter by default than everybody else in the classroom and uh and then i started selling uh candy for my backpack which I then upgraded to selling Little Debbie brownies and juice boxes because those are way better than lollipops and airheads. But because I sold candy from my backpack, all the bullies Mm. uh, were attracted to me and they would always try to steal my backpack from me. And uh, So were you doing um, like taekwondo martial arts at a young age? Is that why you got into it or – no, no. Oh. I, I mean, I was always a fan of martial arts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I watched ninja movies growing up and all, all the martial arts movies. So I was a fan of it. But it wasn't until, you know, late in high school, actually. I think it was my sophomore year that I called up a guy. He was, he was the father of one of my friends in high school and I said and he was a he was an instructor, a taekwondo instructor. Mm-hmm. And I called him up and I was like, hey, man, how would I learn Aikido? And he was like, yeah, it's going to take you 25 years to learn, you know, come to my class and I'll teach you how to 
kick ass in two minutes you know, or something like that. You know, he, he's a very man's man mm-hmm. kind of guy. Uh, sixth degree black belt as well. Wow. Former police officer. Where are we going? How do you handle event? bullies? You were, you say you got um, bullied. Yeah. So I ran away. <laughs> I, I hid. I remember in middle school, I would literally plan the way I would walk to my classes mm. around the way the bullies would walk. Like I would go, all the way outside, you know, walk around the building, come back in a side door yeah. just so that I can go like around the corner to, you know, science class yeah. or whatever. That's, that's probably uh, very com- – I mean that's common. You like just survival of the fittest. Like if you don't want to get bullied, you find a way to not get bullied. Yeah, and my, my parents bought me a go-kart when I was younger. So I was the only kid in like three neighborhoods who had a go-kart. And um, I was scared of everybody, so I wouldn't let anybody ride my go kart. So, again, everybody hated me, you know. So, I was the kid who had money in a car, <laughs> and everybody hated me. So, when did things change from switch from being a nerd to, I guess, taking a turn? Uh, let's see, going into my senior year of high school. Yeah. I scored really high on my ASVAB army test that I could have any any position in the military that I wanted. I was going to go in for uh, military intelligence and uh, it was either that or linguistics because there was this hot girl who took the test with me <laughs> and she was going to go into linguistics and I was like, I just want to do whatever she's doing. Um, and then, you know, going into my senior year, I had uh, honors classes, honors history, honors English. I had a 3.8 GPA, I think. Mm-hmm. And coming by the end of my senior year, well, I didn't even make it to the end of the senior year, but uh, I had a 0. 0.08 wow. GPA. And you actually have to try hard to get that low of a GPA. That's crazy. Uh, I would pretty much just sleep through my classes um, what which was crazy because you know the year before that everybody was copying off of me. Right, that's uh, a huge differential, Justin. Yeah, you know what happened? You know, I want to blame it on my mom here, of course. But you know, these days my wife's a psychologist, so we'll anymore. analyze this later. Yeah, so no. she wouldn't let me go. She didn't want me to go into the military, mm. and uh, she made me get a job when. Uh, so I was three months away from my black belt test. And I wanted my black belt and like my, my whole, my, my vision for my life was I was going to go into the military. I was going to get my black belt. I was going to come out. I was going to open a school and I was going to be this kick-ass military black belt guy. Uh, and my mom made me get a job and stop the classes. She made me, uh, she didn't want me to go into the military. So I said no to that. And she's looking out for you. What's that? She's looking out for you. She was looking, yes, she was being a mom, you know, yeah. like I'm, I'm sitting here mad at her, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not mad at her anymore. You yeah. know, we've talked and, uh, but that was, that was it. That was the reason I was very angry and I had nothing left to care for. And so I just gave up for a while. So you had your sights set on going to the army and that when that kind of was taken away, then you just kind of revolted. Yeah. I mean, what else did I have left to care about? Yeah. I mean, so what'd you do to revolt or what'd you do with your days now that you didn't care? Oh man, I um, it kind of happened slowly. You know, I I had a job working at a local grocery store. Met a friend who introduced me to drinking, smoking weed, doing pills, which led to coke, which led wow. to more pills. Eventually, ended up in rehab at one point. Uh, stole a car. Yeah, I stole a car. I used to work at a dealership. My dad got me the job because he was he was the service manager at this Ford dealership. Mm. Got me a job in the back as the uh, detail department, washing cars. And one drug filled night with a friend's brother who had just gotten out of jail teaches me that I could steal a car and that he'll give me this big bag of ecstasy rolls if I steal this car. And I was like, dude, it's so easy. You know, we're drunk. So I'm just, it's so easy. All you got to do is walk back there. The keys are on the board. If you just have a suit, they'll think you're a salesman. And literally that's what happens. You know, if you walked onto a car dealership with a suit and got into a car, nobody would think different. Right. If you just casually did it, it looks just like any other salesman. So 
you know, as we were drunk and talking about it, the conversation got more and more serious. And I remember, you know, like the next day I'm sitting there washing a car and I see this kid drive by in a white Mustang GT. I remember I lost my breath and I fell back into the seat of the car that I was washing and I realized that it was real right then. And wow. And then, uh, you know, so how does that link? I mean, you make a suggestion. I could say, you know, Justin, you should rob this bank over here. You go rob it. Like, why do you get in trouble for that? Uh, so we had like the perfect case too. Uh, so here's how it all went down. And by the way, you know, while all this was happening, I was 17. But by the time I was charged, mm. I was 18. Mm. So I got charged as an adult. That and sucks. apparently, a uh, $30,000 car and Grand Theft Auto, it turns it into a first-degree felony, which is the same as homicide. Wow. So, yeah, that's not good. Um, so here's how I got in trouble. Yeah. He decided that he was going to go up on the highway in this stolen white Mustang GT and do 125 miles an hour. <laughs> Very discreet. As- <laughs> You know, I mean, hey, because you're in a Mustang GT, right? You know, who cares that it was stolen? So he gets, obviously, gets pulled over by a cop. His girlfriend, trying to save him, says, uh, blames it all on me. Mm. Jesus. They they come after me, and I'm telling my dad, you know, I no, no, of course not. I don't have any. What are these guys crazy? Uh, I don't know anything about this. Uh, then, you know, so they take me in for questioning and while I'm in the jail cell, the police jail cell, not like there's lots of layers of jail, you know, um, right, right. And so I'm really just in like a holding station and a cop comes back there and he's like yelling and he's like, we've got video proof. We had video cameras up there. We know that you stole seven cars. You're part of this ring. You know, he starts laying all this stuff on me. I'm like, dude, no way. No way. I only stole one. And he's like, will you will you swear to that? And I was like, of course. Yeah, I only stole one. He never had anything on me. Right, he made that's the whole crazy. thing up and I rolled on myself. So it's all for the better now, you know. I mean, it's still that's haunts crazy, me. That's crazy, Justin. So that's What's like that? he was using serious psychological tactics against you. Oh, he was talking about how they were going to bust into my house uh, when my my little sister was on the you know in the bathroom and imagine my little sister on the bathroom with guns drawn and you know I mean, they were using really powerful psychological uh, manipulation Jeez. on me and it worked. You know, uh, I rolled on myself. Looking back, I'm glad that I did. It's all over. I don't have to look behind my shoulders or anything. But right. that's followed me my whole life. Every yeah. you know, when I went to Australia recently, you know, I almost got turned back. Really? You know? Yeah, because I have a felony record. I can't vote. I can't own a firearm. I you know, not only do I have a felony record, it's a first degree felony. You know? Wow. So did you um, actually go to jail? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I'd never done anything even remotely wrong before Mm. I was out pretty quickly and the judge gave me what's called withheld adjudication, which means that if I wanted to, it's, it's just before like an expunge or a pardon where basically they take a Sharpie marker and they cross out my name on all the documents. And the only people who would know about it is the military because you can't erase anything from the military. Mm. Um, but I've never done that because... As sick as it sounds, I kind of like the reminder. I kind of like that it, you know, gives, uh, you know, I did it, you yeah, know, so yeah. I should pay for it. And uh, so I've never done, I've never, you know, gone through that process. But yeah, it's followed me around my whole life, man. That's crazy. So what about, you know, what tips do you have or, I don't know if tips is the right word. Can but steal cars? No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes. No. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't just sell the car, and but yeah. that's fine. Um, that was the idea. No rehab. What is rehab like? And, and you know that's not an easy. Those aren't easy habits to kick. You know. You know, I was in a different place when I when I went. Um, it was very easy for me. It was uh, basically. It was a really clear awakening that I was. I had gone down the wrong road. 
when I was in there, everybody that was in there, I was like, I am not these people. And I hate to, and I even got some grief, you know, or some guff, I guess, from people that were in there. Like, oh, you think you're better than us? You're just going to come out and quit? And I was like, watch me. You know, I am, it was just very apparent to me that I was not these people. And I was done. You know, that was it. I mean, I, I kicked the, it was Xanax. Which the craziest thing is, is I was in there for pills, but I couldn't swallow a pill. I, I really? would crush up the pills or we would snort the pills back then. And uh, so I couldn't swallow a pill, but I was in rehab for pills. So, you went through well, the extra effort. You should have seen me trying to explain that to them. <laughs> You're like, there's an easier way. There's a better way. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So you just, just want to quit and you did. Yeah, you know, it was metal cots, you know, sleeping on metal cots in a wide open room uh, with bad people, a lot of bad people in there. And, you know, jail plus rehab equals, wow. I It's an awakening. Yeah, I need a major redirection in yeah. my life because I am not where I want to be. And, you know, it wasn't long after that that I was searching on the internet how to start a business, how to make yeah. money online. Yeah. So what was next? What was the early days of your career? What did that look like? Because obviously you know, you're no longer going in the Army. What would you do? I worked construction. I worked Wendy's. Yeah. Kind of somehow landed in a couple of sales jobs. Yeah. Realized I had a knack for sales. Um and I became, uh, you know, I started beating all the other reps on the sales floor. Mm -hmm. And one, you know, I realized every every day for lunch, I would eat a ramen noodle soup and my boss would eat a whole lemon pepper chicken. It always comes back to food for me. Me too. So I keep talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here I am, one of the hot shot sales people. Literally, I'm, you know, one of the guys winning the what award. What were you selling? Uh, at this point, we were selling um, like lighting like mostly the warehouses fluorescent lighting and stuff mm -hmm. like that um and so here i am you know one of the star salesmen of the company i'm eating i can only afford to eat ramen noodle soups every morning and my boss is eating whole lemon pepper chickens and really at that time all i ever saw him do is in the morning he would flick on the lights mm -hmm. and he'd go into his office so all I, I was like, man, all this guy does is flick on the lights and he, he's eating these whole chickens. I now realize that he was doing a lot more, right. but uh, it kind of... It's just know, what you see at the time. Right, yeah. yeah. I was like, I don't want to be the guy making 25%, uh, and that was my commission at the time. I want to be the guy who's flicking on the lights, making the 75%. So one day I came into work and instead of selling lights, I sold websites. And told people I'd design their websites for them because my grandfather had kind of sort of taught me how to build a website back when I was a nerd. And uh, which I've reverted back to nerdery again now. Um, just the nerd with tats. Um, <laughs> That's a new tagline so, on your site, the nerd with tats. But yeah, yeah, yeah nerd with tats. Uh, so yeah, I, I sold websites, sold five of them, probably just because I was so excited and wanted out of that place. Yeah. Went in there, told my boss, I'm starting a business. I just got my first couple of clients, shook his hand, left. The next day, none of those people would pick up the phone for mm -hmm. me. I couldn't sell another deal for months and months. And uh, I slowly turned into an internet marketer because I realized that I could build websites, but nobody wanted me to really do that for them. You know, I was begging people, let me build you a website for 189 bucks. And nobody would take that offer. And so I started to learn how to, as back then, you know, my goal was I wanted a website that paid my bills. Right. That's what turned me on to internet marketing and information marketing. Right. So Justin, go back because you were, you learned from listening to these closers at lunch, mm. right? So what are some of the things you learned that helped you with your sales? <sighs> Probably some of the biggest lessons I learned, you know, there was this guy Tully. And uh, Tully was the, the, the quintessential salesman. Uh, you know, he was amazing. You have a big smile on your face as you talk about yeah, him. Uh, Tully was, he was, he was, a, he was a real life living character of a movie. You know, he was 
you know, lived in like a one bedroom apartment and I'm pretty sure he did crystal meth or crack at night, but That's during a typical the day, sales. <laughs> but during the day he would come in and he would just be like the coolest, smoothest talking, most educated. I mean, he would just close people in that room when other top closers couldn't close someone, they'd bring the phone over to Tully. Mm. And I sat closest to Tully just, mm. That just was my assigned seat. Mm. So I became very friendly with him. And the first thing he told me, I wish I had a real phone around. You know, all we have now is these cell phones. But imagine an old school phone that has, you know, the little cups and the little holes in it. And he says, look into these holes right here. And he's holding the phone in front of my face. And he says, do you think a hand can come out of that phone and touch you and slap you or anything? So why are you scared of anybody on the other end of that phone? And that was a huge lesson. You know, it, it removed my fear mm -hmm. of the other end of the phone. Yeah. You know, that, um, you know, Tully would say, you can say whatever you want. I now know that you can't say whatever you want <laughs> over the phone. That's called wire fraud. Um, yeah. So what are some of the things that he said that you did learn from in a positive sense on, on one of the sales calls? Yeah, so I mean, I learned you know to get over the fear of the phone. There, I learned to that you can't have desperation. You can, if you're if you need money, you will never be able to make a sale. Mm -hmm. it, it just won't happen. So you have to have a complete disregard for money if you really want to be able to sell. It, like a poker player, a poker player doesn't look at his money like it's sacred. He looks at it like points. You know, this is points to the game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it happens in the stock market. It happens in poker. It happens in sales. So I learned to stop obsessing over money and giving money such a high, you know, putting it on the pedestal. Uh, what else did I learn? You know, I, I learned to practice my pitch. You know, these guys, they knew their pitch backwards, sideways. Mm -hmm. You know, they could give it at any given moment. So I learned to practice I learned to dial. Uh, do they teach uh, you? Like, do they give you sales training at this? Like, this is how man, you overcome objections, or they just hand you the phone and say, "Go for yeah, it." This was like a boiler room. I mean, we we would at five o'clock, the vodka bottles would all come out. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was, yes, it was a boiler room. It was a timeshare resales yeah. operation, and for whatever it was, it taught me a lot of great lessons. Um, mm -hmm. So, so what yeah, point, no Justin, in this in this whole scheme, do you meet your wife? What's that? What, at what point do you meet your wife in this in the timeline? She was kind of along for the whole ride. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I remember when, when we were just barely dating. I told her, I was like, "Are you really sure you want to be in a relationship with me? It's going to be a really bumpy ride." And uh, and she that's was like, "Not a good opening line." <laughs> <laughs> but that's she was horrible. like, that's okay. I'm I'm with you. And you know, we joke about that moment today and we're like, wow, <laughs> this was not bumpy. This was like mountains and valleys. So how uh, old were you when you met her? Uh you know, I met her in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, we we first went out. I asked her to be my girlfriend in 10th grade. We were on a we were in band together. And the we were both in the drum line, and the drum line took a camping trip that was very low supervised. So a girl and a boy ended up in a tent overnight. And we were young, so get your minds out of the right, gutters. Right. But, you know, there was a little bit of kissing and whatever. And so, you know, the next morning we were boyfriend and girlfriend. And... But I was I was I was too uncool for her back then. So she, you know, about two months later, she broke up with me over a note, saying that I was literally saying that I was too uncool. Uh, and then I went and became a criminal, and then met her again. <laughs> <laughs> I know the real motivation for all this is to get, yes, get her. It was all to win her. <laughs> so uh, I, I, it was the year after. I didn't graduate. I was going to say the year after I graduated, but I didn't graduate. Uh, the year after I was supposed to graduate, I came back to the school. I was actually with another girlfriend at the time who was also in band. Uh, and we were watching, you know, the band camp or whatever, reminiscing. Mm -hmm. And I saw her there and I was like, oh, hey. And uh, she gave me her number. We went out to the beach that night and had a couple of beers. And I was apparently cool enough at that point. Nice. 
Because I, were, I asked because I know in this timeline, there was a point where you mentioned that you're both working at different mm-hmm. food-related jobs for huh. that reason. Yeah, so we, you know, we knew each other each other. Uh, like m- almost my whole life, right? Mm. Like since freshman, s- sophomore year, mm. and I'm 33 now, so that's like 20 years. And um, but yeah, so this is like I guess 2001, 2002 kind of area, right after the whole jail, around the whole jail stuff happened. That's about when <laughs> I was cool enough for her, <laughs> and we got together, and I basically got kicked out of my house, and she said, "You can come live with me." Mm. And uh, and through living with her, you know, we just didn't make a whole lot of money. And then we had a kid on top of that. And so we literally I worked at Wendy's. She worked at Pizza Hut. We couldn't afford to eat. So we made sure we stayed working at food jobs. That way we could bring home dinners and stuff. Right. So we've eaten everything on the menu at Wendy's and Pizza Hut. So there was a big turning point, Justin, when. Um, you brought your son home. Yes. Tell me about that. Uh, you know, for me, the party and the celebration was always about alcohol and drugs at that point in my life anyways. Uh, this is, I think it was 2003. I got to check my arm here. Yes, 2003. Right. It's a reminder, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can't read it because there's a line through it. No. Right, <laughs> yeah. So I come home. My dad's there. You know, my mom and my dad are there. We just bring the baby home to, uh, I think it was my parents' house at that time. And the baby goes to sleep. And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm going to have a drink. I just had a kid. I'm a dad. You know, let's party. I take once. I ask my dad if he wants a sip of the whiskey. And he's like, no. And he gives me a weird look. Mm. And so I'm like, oh, screw you. I'm drinking up. And so I take a sip, maybe another sip maybe three and all of a sudden the baby cries down the hallway and in a flash i just realized it was like as the alcohol you know you can kind of feel when you take a shot you kind of feel it enter your blood you get that feeling of you know the alcohol is hitting it was like as the alcohol was hitting the baby started crying and i was like how am i going to take care of this kid tonight Mm. if i'm drunk right and then it flooded into how am I going to take care of this kid if I'm a criminal drug addict? You right, know, they, right. like, let alone just drinking some whiskey tonight. That was the moment really when everything changed for me. Is, you know, he cried down that hallway and uh, had to change. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I knew when you told that story that the kid wasn't going to bed for long. So, because they don't. They, they... <laughs> Yeah, it was actually my young, my uh, my oldest sister who had woken him up at the time. Oh. Yeah. So this, through this whole thing, what does your dad tell you, or does he like just just make your mistakes and learn from them, or did he at some point kind of take you aside and have a talk with you? Because I could tell, like from that story, he kind of maybe I don't know leads by example, but it's just like no. Kind of, you kind of see what he's. How he he's would, uh, he would try. He would try to tell me, you know, to stop or, you know. Yeah. But I, I, I think after a while, he had kind of learned that I. <clears throat> I'm just the type of person who learns the hard way. You know, that's just how I learn. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta trip and fall. Yeah. So, he would let me trip and fall, and yeah. uh, then you know he was always there to pick me back up. Yeah, you know, he yeah. was. He was there to drive me to my probation meetings. He was there to help me pass the drug test that one day when I really needed to on probation because uh, you're not supposed to do drugs on probation. Um, he was always there for me. You know, I uh, Even though I had stolen a car from the job he helped me get, uh, you know, he, he still stayed there. Yeah. it's a, I still feel it's a little far stretch that you stole it. I mean – that you stole actually stole a car. I mean, they, they kind of that whole thing. They kind of pinned it on you, but but yes, whatever you had the idea. I was the accomplice. Yes. Um, so, you know, Justin, it makes me think. So, what was the next big turning point for you? So, the Wendy's days, Pizza Hut days. What was the next turning point? You know, I mean, after that, it, it all kind of. I'm not saying it, it became smooth ride right. and all of a sudden I was, you know, partying like a rock star. It was still, you know, our business failed three times. Yeah. 
Like, what uh-huh. kind of businesses do you start in between? Because, like you said, first year, mm-hmm. you know, what uh, evolution did it go through? Like, okay, yeah, you're off I'll on web the, design. I'll give you the quick rundown. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Monavi was the first one. It was an ML- MLM, like a juice MLM, acai berries. Mm-hmm. Um I could only ever sell a bottle to my mom. That was the only bottle I ever sold. And then after that, I started a website about anxiety because I had been diagnosed with uh, severe anxiety and panic attacks, which is part of the reason for the Altoids. Peppermint helps calm the nerves. Really? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it does. Um, so I started a website about anxiety. That's where I made my first like affiliate sale online. I had read a pirated copy of an ebook called The Rich Jerk. Mm-hmm. And in there, it taught me how to use. What's funny is uh, he taught me how to send PPC traffic, Google AdWords traffic to an article. It was native advertising way before, way, way before. And I didn't know how to build a website really. I mean, I kind of thought I did, but not really. So I wrote an article and I drove traffic to the article and at the bottom of the article was an affiliate link for a product. That's how I made my first affiliate sale. Um, yeah. And then from there, you know, that was like, I mean, I think I was making $300 a year. <laughs> so it was, it was not much. Landed an internship with a millionaire out in Idaho yeah. where, you know, he yeah. just, he was one of the gurus that I was following sure. at the time as I was trying to learn how to do all this stuff. Mm-hmm. He uh, put an ad in a forum saying, hey, I'm looking for an intern. It's unpaid. You will have to work. Because I had sales skills, I found all of his phone numbers and I made sure I was the guy. Right. I later found out that I was actually the only one who was willing to go out to Idaho. Hmm. Everybody else wanted to do the internship from home. And that's so that's why I actually won the internship is I was the only idiot who was willing to go out to Idaho and work for free, which changed my life and I love right. it. You know, so I mean I still I remember Justin that video of you giving a testimonial. Um, there's a Russell Brunson. Uh, there's some testimonial oh, video. The video and yeah. Um, yeah. And that sticks out to me when I, I still remember it was watching about my it. Dad. What's that? It was about my dad. You know, he, Ooh, man, the emotions come rushing back in. Uh, I was talking about the, f- my, the first time I made like my big money on the internet, mm-hmm. I had made $15,000. Mm-hmm. That was ludicrous money. You know, to me and anybody in my family, that was ludicrous money. And I remember telling my dad after and after all this criminal drug stuff, stealing cars happened. Here I am telling him that I've made it on the Internet. I made fifteen thousand dollars on the Internet. He he tells me he's proud of me and he gives me a hug. And Mm. and that moment meant a lot to me. And, it, you know, really, I owe a lot to that to Russell Brunson because he taught me how to do those things. And he was part of that website. And. So, yeah, he yeah. Uh, caught me crying on one of his interviews. Which it's powerful. Happens. Yeah. It no, is. it's powerful. I, I mean, that sticks out in my head. I still remember that. We all I mean, I don't know how long ago that was, but it wasn't yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. So what did you learn on the internship? I know you're going you're gonna to go past that, but obviously you go – and you, you know, I don't say you're the only idiot to go out there because you, you're going to go the extra mile and you'll do whatever it takes, which means yeah. maybe moving out there. Maybe I was the only smart guy. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, I mean, you just were willing to do whatever it took at that point. Yeah. yeah. You know? And, and that's really been the recurring theme. You know, I, I've kind of learned that I, I don't, I don't get things or I don't win things because I'm smarter than anybody else i just usually end up being the guy who's willing to work harder than anybody else or to do what the other people aren't willing to do um and so i get to achieve things that other people aren't and you know my job out there was to he it has this kind of you know famous in small circles kind of thing his his marketing library is famous in small circles because it's huge you know he's at this point he's probably spent a half million or a million dollars but at that point it was a quarter million dollar marketing library you know so imagine a quarter million dollars of every book seminar course anything you wanted to know about marketing and my job was to read watch listen to all this material and write affiliate review articles on each one of the courses mm-hmm. so he could make his money back 
well, I got the education of a lifetime because mm. I was learning from Dan Kennedy and Chet Holmes and Jay Abraham and uh, all kinds of other guys. I can't remember yeah. all the names at the moment, but I got the education of a lifetime. It was still unpaid, uh, but I did take my $300 a year website to about $1,500 a year while I was there. Took my education back home. Yeah. Begged my wife to let me use just $60. I was like, man, just give me some money to start a paid ad traffic, a paid ad campaign on Google. Yeah. And she let me. And so uh, I, I actually had to borrow that money from the electric bill. We didn't even have the 60 bucks. Paid half the electric bill, took the 60 bucks, put it into a pathetic $2 a day AdWords campaign. Doubled my money that month. I made 150. Paid the electric bill. Put the money back in. Double, 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 double. Eleven months in a row, I got a six-figure business. That's pretty and amazing. It was cool. It was awesome. You know, it was. I, I remember the coolest part was that I would go out to Red Lobster, and when I would come home, the amount that I had just spent at Red Lobster would be refilled in PayPal just yeah. from the sales. Yeah. So that was always really awesome. Um, so that was, you know, okay. So that was that website. That was yeah. actually a website about a software called Joomla, which is very yeah. similar to WordPress. Sure. And uh, I was selling a, a course of, uh, you know, 19 videos, how to build a website with Joomla, how to build yeah. a membership site with Joomla, and then sold that. That was what I sold to an Australian investor for $15,000. And then from there, People wanted to know how to sell websites, how to, you know, and that became a popular thing for a while. And now there's like whole big marketplaces. And so I taught people how to buy and sell websites for a profit. I had SiteFlipAcademy.com. Russell Brunson, the millionaire that I had uh, interned with, bought that website off me when I wanted to get out of that. Tried to do a couple of other things. Didn't really work. I think I tried a movie review website at one point. I like hearing uh, those things because, you know, the reality is people kind of jump to what worked and they don't realize that you probably went through, you know, 20 different things before. What's that? Try 400. 400 yeah. Right. I, 400 I counted things. at one point. I had 451 domain names that I've bought yeah. and maybe six of those websites right. have made me more than 10 grand. Right. So... Yeah. So I like hearing some of those in between, you know, because we, we often just jump over them and we don't remember or people don't remember or realize what it kind of took to get to where you are. Yeah. You know? Lots and lots and lots of failures. Right. Uh, you know, but, you know, there's this saying that uh, you only got to be right once in your life. You know, forget about all the failures. You only got to be right once, and it's true. You know, and luckily I've been right a couple of times because right. I've uh, turned those wins into failures. Uh, so the next one, you know, I, I, you know, nothing was working after that site. So I reverted back to teaching people how to make money uh, buying and selling websites. Russell wasn't doing anything with Site Flip Academy, so he gave me his blessings, and I started Website Flipping Masters. At that time, we had. Um, we had seminars, we had a home study course, we had a membership site, we had a blog. We were, other than the actual marketplace site point, we were the biggest. Right. Which then turned into Flippa, right? So, I mean, site point. Yeah, site point had then turned into Flippa. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were like the biggest training for uh, website flipping. And now it's a huge industry. Huge. I mean, millions and millions of dollars changing hands yeah. with uh, digital real estate. And then, uh, so I sold that again. I just, I don't like that market. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, you just people, get bored with it or what made you sell it? Cause you're you know, one of the top ones on the internet. It's, it's a market where, you know, it's a lot of beginners. It's a lot of, um, you know, people with a dream in their eye don't really want to do the work. Yeah. And so while I would teach them everything I know, you know, nobody There's really no action. wants to build yeah. a website. Everybody wants to sell a website. Nobody wants to build a website. Yeah. So it just got old. You know, I, I didn't like that market. What I had learned is that throughout that whole process, it was the traffic. You know, and traffic is the thing that it's the key. You know, yeah, it was the thing that got me started. It was the reason why I could sell websites so big. It was the one thing everybody wanted to know when I was teaching them how to buy and sell websites was how do we get traffic. Mm -hmm. And so when 2010, you know, so when I sold Website Flipping Masters, I made a crucial error. 
I forgot that I didn't have a business anymore. And so I never like started anything else. I just kind of lived off of that money. And then one day I realized that the bank wasn't refilling and uh, I had to quickly do something. I think I had like $3,000 left at that moment. And so I had to quickly build another business. But now there was YouTube, there was blogs, there was podcasts, there were, you know, selling information is just way different mm -hmm. now than it was in 2004, 2006. Right. So I decided to sell services instead. And I decided, you know, traffic was the one thing on the internet. It's, Anybody who has anything, any business on the internet or anything to do on the web, on the internet, traffic is like your biggest problem. No it's not going away. You're going to think of it every day. Yep. And somebody who provides that service is always going to have a steady, you know, a secure job. Yeah. So what so is the early like, days of this, what we see now, I am scalable look like? Um, I was actually working for a guy named Rich Sheffrin at strategicprofits.com. He... I was trying to figure out what to do and he was, uh, his affiliate manager had called me up and said, uh, Rich is doing this contest. Whoever wins this contest gets a, a coaching, you know, a coaching session with him. And I was pretty good at traffic and marketing. And so I made sure that I won that contest. They called me back and they were like, how did you do what you did? None of our affiliates have been able to get those results. So I got the coaching session with him. He asked me to do what I did again and paid me for it and then paid me again and again. I was like, you know, you could just like hire me and I <laughs> always do this stuff for you. Right. Um, once he hired me, Everybody wanted to hire me because he, you know, he has a really good name in, in the internet marketing circles. And uh, but with his big budget and with his products and all of his resources, I was really able to master the craft. I didn't have to worry about the pressures of entre of an entrepreneur right. making sure I was making money. I had a sta steady paycheck, a nice paycheck, a great job, great offers, budget. So I was really able to just learn and master yeah. the craft. And that's where I became good at it. And eventually, you know, basically people would ask me to drive traffic for them and they would pay me and I would say yes. Eventually I had an agency by default because I had a bunch of clients and then I had to hire people to help me with it. And it just got weird at one point to be explaining to my employees why I had to go and be on a, you know, a, a company meeting for another company. Uh, so I, we, I left uh, with Rich on good terms yeah. and started I Am Scalable. So what were some of the interesting data, if you can talk about any of it, that you saw? Because that's another big part. I mean, the learning, but you see tons of data coming through when you're working for strategic po profits. What did you learn from seeing that data that you took to your agency? Yeah, I really learned that it was about relevancy you know, that was one of the key lessons that kept coming up over and over again. The more relevant your ad is to their problem and to the product. So you have, you have the person's problem, you have your product, and then you have everything in between. That's the ad, the landing page, the autoresponder sequence, the shopping carts. The smoother you can make that line from their problem to buying your product, the more conversions you're going to have. And the smoothness of that line mm. is called relevance. Right. So the more relevant your product and everything in that step of how you sell your product is to that person's problem and the way that they phrase and think about that problem, the more relevant it is, the more conversions you're going to have. So mm. I learned that it wasn't about just crazy ads or tricking people or uh, just driving a massive amount of traffic and hoping for sales. It was about relevance. I really learned that lesson there. And I also learned the lesson of testing, testing lots of segments because I had a big budget. I was able to, I would never, I was never able to test right. a lot of things before then, but because I had a big budget, I could test all of my wild ideas, all the different ads and landing pages. And I had, access to a team of web designers and split testers and all that stuff. So I really learned the value and how split testing is really the thing that makes or breaks campaigns. Yeah. So what's an example, Justin, that you could give people about how you increase relevance so they can kind of visualize that? 
All right, so... I tell you what I okay. picture. I picture you getting inside the mind of the person and somehow displaying that as a message or a picture or whatever the case is. I don't know if that's that's mm -hmm. the case or not. What people have to understand is is frames. There's a great book called Picture uh, Pitch Pitch Anything. Mm -hmm. I forget the author. Oren uh, Clout. Class. Yeah, 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 yeah. He talks a lot about the the uh, about frames, and everybody has a frame of thought. You know, call it their mindset, the way they think, whatever. It's a frame of mind that they're in, mm. and everybody is in a frame of mind. And then your web your sales page is supposed to kind of put them into another frame of mind or or match their frame of mind. Right. You know. All right. So you know, to illustrate this. One of the campaigns, I was selling a weight loss supplement to women. Mm -hmm. So I created a, an ad that had a pink background and I had a picture of a you know healthy, fit woman who was excited. Sounds like a decent ad image. I had good headline on there of like, want to lose weight. Sounds pretty good. But then when they got to, you know, so yeah, they wanted to lose weight, but when they got to the page and it was about green coffee beans, what? No, this isn't, that's not the frame that they had about how to lose weight. Right. Their way of losing weight was a different frame. And so when I changed the picture of the ad to just a green coffee bean and said, want to lose weight, when they landed on the page and saw a video about green coffee beans... Now it fit their frame of mind. Yeah. And so that's what I mean about smoothing out that line and, right. and making it relevant. Uh, and that's what increased the conversions. And that client really taught me a big lesson. Uh, you know, Normally I would have just said, hey, dude, your, your, your offer is not converting. But he was like, no, we have five other guys buying traffic for this. It's you. Uh, you're the only anomaly here that's not converting. Right. So I changed my ad, and sure enough, it was it was that's when I learned really, really learned the art of uh, relevance. Yeah, yeah, I love that. You know, you go in a lot of detail. People should obviously sign up for the the case studies that you have because you go in way more detail in that. And what's interesting is the message is not that different. I mean, the picture changes, but I oh, the ad copy was exactly exactly the same. The same. Yeah, and it does say exactly what it does, you know, lose weight or whatever. It was just that picture mm -hmm. that put people in that different frame. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's 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 the magic of paid ads. It's... So now you leave, now you essentially have an agency now. So what is that looking like? What are you doing in the early parts of kind of striking on your own? Because that is also nerve wracking too. You know, I'm really struggling with hiring. You know, that's uh, I'm great at marketing, sales. I could sell like nobody's business. There's, there's not another salesman or marketer in this world that I don't think I could go head to head with. Um, but keeping and growing a team of people, man, that just Tough. that evades me, man. That is, uh, you know, everything else about business, the finances, accounting. Legal, HR, hiring, I hate all that stuff, man. Right. I'm just a glorified salesman who learned how to use the internet. And uh, so that's my struggle right now is yeah. really, you know, how do I go from a salesman to a CEO? How do right. I how do I be the boss, uh, literally be the boss? And that's my struggle that I'm going through right now. I don't know the answer. Yeah. So if anybody was hoping I had some big tip for it. It's a good pain to have, though. It means you're growing. It yeah. means you're in demand and it means you need more people to fill that demand, you know? Yeah. So what are some of the big milestones you've hit in order to get to where you are? I know that the weight loss is a big one. I know you talk about um, the dentist. That was an interesting one. Um, what was the big lesson you learned with working with the dentist? Uh, yeah, so the dentist, we helped them increase their total yearly revenue by 40% or something like that. We had an amazing campaign, uh, just a really lasered in Google AdWords search campaign for a dentist that had retargeting on top of it. Um, there's something so beautiful about a, about a Google campaign that's really dialed in, like no more, no keywords. All the ads are dialed in. The keywords are dialed in. There's no waste anymore in the account. And then you add retargeting on top of that to try and just 
really squeeze the juice out. So, you know, with that one, um, I don't know what I really learned. I learned the, you know, good structure to your ad accounts mm. really matters a yeah. lot. You know, it's like a scientist who has a messy lab. Right. You're probably going to get messy results. You know, if you have a nice, clean, organized lab, you're probably going to get better results. It's just more efficient mm. that way. So, you know, uh, my the way that I structure all of my campaigns and my accounts is very systematic. Um, mm. So what's something you did to structure it that really helped? What's what? What's something you did to structure it that really helped with the, the dentist campaign? You know, we had one keyword, per, one keyword per ad group and one landing page per ad group. So to most people, that would seem like a massive amount of work. And it, you know, I'm not going to lie. It was not easy. I mean, we did, right. we only did like five per week and we created, we did, we made the landing pages on WordPress. That way it was very easy to duplicate the pages on the same template and just right. update the content. Um, but so we would do five per week and we ended up getting to like 35, 50 keywords and landing pages, which meant ad groups as well. But right. because each ad group was for one keyword and one landing page, again, that line, you know, the relevance, if somebody right. searches that keyword, my ad is all about just that keyword. My landing right. page is all about just that keyword. It's right. that relevance. Yeah. I know one thing, Justin, I learned from it that I took out of it is um, the consumption. You know, we don't often think, kind of going back to how you were viewing your YouTube on, you know, on the TV, right? Mm -hmm. And you made a good point, which is in that the doctor, the dentist wanted calls. So you had them display on mobile because that's where people made calls. And I thought that was like a head slap for me. Like, yeah. Of course, you know, they're sitting with a phone in their hand, right? And so that was really interesting to think back of how the person's consuming it. That's one of the biggest things I got out of that, that case study personally. Cool. Yeah. So what about with the, the sinus, what should people know about the uh, sinoprex? I think I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> Cause you mentioned at the Which top like, of the interview, the zombie. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the, the sinoprex, uh, Selling sinus pills. Nobody cares about sinus pills. Right. Listen, we could just stop the conversation there, and that's really it. You know, nobody really cares about sinus pills unless you're having a sinus headache at the moment. Right. At that point, you care about anything. You will literally use this weird pot full of water and pour it up your nose to get rid of a sinus Which I've headache. done that, yeah. Yes. The people will go through extreme measures to get rid of a sinus headache. And so the problem with selling them online though is you know unless you serve the ad to the person at that moment, no sale. I right. don't care what you do, what ad you create, yeah. it's just not happening. Uh, so yeah. what I did is I created a new promotion, a new, uh, new sales video that basically taught people what the sinuses do and why you should always have them working healthy and clean. And ever since I did all this research, uh, people would say that the video's over the top, but it's all true. I've done the research myself. I searched the stuff in PubMed, in scientific places, I am now paranoid about my sinuses. Why? What's over the top? What do people say is over the top with the video? I basically said that there are killer. There's a killer fungus in every single household, and there there technically is. Well, I don't know about every single household, but in most households, there is fungus behind the walls, under the carpets. There, fungus is everywhere. Right. It's just something that we live with, and that's what our sinuses do for us. They help right. us. They're they're like a your own body's gas mask that's filtering out bacteria, viruses, funguses. Yeah. So I created this video that basically scared the crap out of people about yeah. everything that they're breathing in and said, no worries. If your sinuses are working fine, all that stuff, your body is just naturally able to heal that uh, yeah. for you. But if they're not, maybe you want to buy these pills. And that's kind of, you know, the really, mm -hmm. really short, dramatic mm -hmm. version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you look for that big, 
that big hook in the in the solving or actually exposing the pain that's going to cause for the, the yeah person. in in my in my research i had found a news article where they said uh they you know it was called zombie disease it was about this tornado that had come through uh mississippi or missouri or one of those states and mm -hmm. dug up a new fungus that sprung into the air and it made it started eating people's back you know skin and um <laughs> that would scare me yeah <laughs> yeah 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 so that's kind of how the sales video starts out about all these cases of fungus you know in yeah. and around people's houses and people who like uh their kid would break open the wall and all of a sudden these spore clouds would come out of it and you know yeah. people don't know what's behind those walls yeah. it ain't it ain't good yeah um so yeah that, that's basically yeah. what it was about so that kind of goes into your REM. So people use ADA. Tell me, tell people about REM. Man, you, you really did your homework, man. Nobody knows about REM. Uh, I had given up on even trying to pr to push that one. Uh, well, sure. So, it's like it's like five minute abs opposed to six minute abs. Like you have ADA. That's four letters. Let's go to REM. It's three letters. <laughs> yeah. So ADA is attention, interest, desire, action, right. and. In copywriting books and schools, that is like what is taught. I think that's even taught in like colleges. A lot of people talk about, yeah. A lot of copywriters talk about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So ADA is has always been like the format. Uh, I believe in REM, uh, relevance, education, and motivation. Mm -hmm. So you need to the the top. I don't care if you're making a video, an email, a blog post, whatever you're doing. If it's not relevant, doesn't matter. Period. They're just not going to listen to it. Yeah. Um, and then once you've related to them, you then need to educate them about what it is you're talking about. So if you're talking about sinuses, you need to educate them about what their sinuses do and why they're important and why should, why they should care. And then once you've educated them about that, you then need to motivate them to take an action. Yeah. And so I think it's a much simpler, easier to understand way of writing any blog post, any email, any video is, you know, REM, relevance, educate, motivate. Right, right. I like that because also you talk about relevance with the ad, you know, getting from that person's pain to the product, that smooth line you is the relevance, which is the right. first thing that you talk about, you know, has to be that match, whether it's you're talking about the frame matching or whatever it is, it's got to be relevant to that person. And then right. going into, you know, I like the education. Um, and, you know, it just, I like that step process that you talk about. So, um, the, so I, and all this stuff you learned because you had, you made mistakes and there's failures along the way. What are one of the biggest, we'll call it learning experiences. Um, that you had with the camp yeah. <laughs> I mean, it directly um, with um, paid advertising with a campaign. So biggest learning experiences with paid ads? Yeah, like a mistake, failure, where you had to tweak that you didn't shut it off or whatever happened. Yeah. Um, Horror stories, so whatever. Our number one rule, the golden rule, you can break every other rule. Don't break this one. I fired a guy over it. Is every campaign, every ad has to have a tracking link. Hmm. If there is not a tracking link and you have not tested that link, that ad should not go live. Mm -hmm. You might as well just go take the money outside and burn it. There's really not much different. So that is, you know, golden rule. Don't break that rule. Uh, because then I'm the one who has to explain to the client why they've spent money, but we don't know what you know that money did. <clears throat> yes. So what? So in, in that re in that respect, what are some of the uh, softwares or tools you use for for tracking? You know, there's a lot of them out there, and you know, none of them are perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, we're just in a time right now, a, a time in technology where everything is changing. We're going from cookie based tracking, which was kind of what we've done forever on the internet. You know, I mean, not the very earliest days, but that's kind of what we've done. And now we're moving into people based tracking and, you know, or ID based tracking. So basically 
instead of a browser cookie, which, you know, phones, they take cookies, but they delete them right away. And not all mobile devices accept cookies anyways. Um, you know, these cookies are ways of tagging people. And so then we know, okay, if we tag this person, we can, you know, we don't know who they are, but we know that this tag did these actions. Right. And that's how tracking has always worked. Mm -hmm. Well, now, because of all these different devices and different channels and everything, tagging just doesn't work anymore. So now we need to understand who the person is, and that's Apple IDs, Open IDs, Microsoft IDs, Google IDs. These companies have enough people tagged that they can say, you know, here's – They'll just call them an ID. It's not a cookie. Mm -hmm. It's just an ID number. And we can see this person going from their desktop to their laptop to their work computer, uh, signing on to their friend's computer. We can watch what that person does. So with that said, um, you know, there are some really like, exciting Disclaimer, tools. this may change in a week type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 With that said, uh, there are some really exciting things coming out and tracking is about to get amazing. Uh, you want to look at platforms like AOL One. You want to look at Facebook Atlas. You want to look at um, anybody who's talking about people-based campaigns or people-based tracking. That's kind of a buzzword right now for mm -hmm. it. Um, other than that, you know, you, you got to use you know Google Analytics is great. It's it's a lot to learn. There's a lot of great information on YouTube about it, but it can be pretty hard. But for a free tool, it's it's amazing. Right. Um, it's pretty much the best tool that's out there. It's just very complicated to learn how to use. Uh, another great tool would be Mixpanel, which is kind of like Google Analytics, but a little bit easier to figure out. Mm -hmm. Also starts out free. You don't have to start paying for it until you're generating a pretty decent amount of traffic. Mm -hmm. Mixpanel and Google. And then that's the other thing they need to understand is there's analytics and then there's tracking. Right. Mixpanel... Uh, Kiss Metrics, uh, Google Analytics, that's all analytics, which is your bounce rates, your time on site, all the pages, where are they coming from, right. uh, who are the referring sources. It's all that data. Tracking is different. Tracking is this person, how many clicks did I get on this ad or this link? Yeah. And did those people opt in? Did they buy something? That's tracking. It's very linear. Right. It's for one specific thing. So for tracking, I use Improvely. Mm -hmm. I really like them. Um, Google Analytics has tracking links. Mixpanel has tracking links. Uh, I built my own software called Pixel Track. Yeah, That's I have that in my note, actually. I sold it. I just realized I just... I don't know anything about programming. I don't really know how to hire programmers. To run a tracking software, you need you know much better servers, and you need to right. you just need to know a lot more about the internet than I really know about. Yeah. Uh, great tool, great interface, just didn't have the back end. It's, so it's, it's not your core. It's not what you wanted to do. Right. So I sold it to a guy who he did understand all that stuff. Yeah. So. The tool's still great. It's just not mine anymore. Yeah. Um, it's basically the exact opposite of Google Analytics, where Google Analytics has all kinds of buttons and things in the interface. We had one button, and I, I made sure that all throughout the design phase, right. there was one button on the dashboard, right. and you would start there, and then you could do more, and you That's could always pixel get track? more information. What's that? Pixel track. Yeah, Pixel Track, T R A K K. Yeah. Uh, Improvely, uh, there's a new thing coming out called LTVTracker.com. Uh, there's a lot of tracking yeah, tools. Yeah. They're all pretty much about the same. <laughs> exactly. There's probably, you have a list of 202 of those. So, what about, ret what are some, just a few of the retargeting people should use? I know you, you mention a lot and talk a lot about retargeting, which is important. Uh, retargeting, I use Google Remarketing. I've tried a lot of the different platforms. Uh, Remarketer.com is good. You know, the problem I don't like about a lot of the remarketing, retargeting, is there's so many rules, you know, with perfect – the problem – there's layers to this, you yeah. know, it's, so that's why I'm stuttering. No, bit. that's – I understand. Like I ask, like, uh, how do you get traffic to a website? You know, it's like a big, yeah. a big yeah. question, but – so the a lot of these retargeting networks like AdRoll and Perfect Audience, mm -hmm. 
they don't actually own the traffic. They they built a piece of software for a company who actually owns the traffic. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember the name of the network right now, but um, anyway, there's somebody else who governs what people are allowed to do and say with those ads mm -hmm. and ad roll and perfect audience just built an interface for mm -hmm. that traffic. They're middlemen right. where Google is, you know, it's, it's actually the traffic. Right. They own the inventory and the, the, a lot of the publications. And so it's direct uh, with Google. You can do things like you can target people who have been on your page for more than 45 seconds or two minutes or whatever. So if you're retargeting, people who are landing on your page, well, we know right off the jump that 60 to 80% of those were going to bounce anyways. Right. You know, I mean, a good page has a 60% bounce rate, maybe right. 40%. So most yeah. of those people that you just pixeled with your retargeting were horrible. You know, half, half of it was garbage, wasted money. Uh, that's not good. So I like to use Google because Google allows you to basically only take the people who've been on the page for X amount of seconds. Mm. That way it's much more high, higher quality, much more qualified. I'm creating a software with a guy that will allow people to do that with any pixel. Mm. And I think it's going to be free. I don't know. I, I'm just helping the guy with the ideas. He, he's building it out. It's his thing. Right. Um, but yeah, we're building a piece of software. It'll be at, it'll be at codedelay.com. Mm -hmm. Know what's there right now. So, mm -hmm. But that's where it will be, and uh, it'll be a little plug-in that you can drop your code yeah. in there. And it basically just hides your code from the browser for X amount of seconds and then shows it. Mm -hmm. And you also talk about something valuable, which is sometimes you only put that on like the shopping cart page, you know, yes. for shopping cart abandonment. <clears throat> right. Yeah. You want to... Um, you know, this was a, a relevancy thing. You know, uh, I started out pixeling everybody because I was like, wow, you know, this is like cool. free list building. They don't right. even have to opt in. You know, I just put this pixel on here and I got them. But, you know, then I quickly learned that that, that was a very irrelevant audience. Mm -hmm. Well, who's very relevant? Somebody mm -hmm. who went through the whole process and landed on the order page but right. didn't buy. Right. There's a lot of reasons why somebody lands on an order page and doesn't buy. And, and, and only one of them is that they weren't interested. It could be that they were on a work computer. It could be that they... Uh, you know, the dinner was ready or the kids were calling them or they just didn't, their wallet was upstairs. You know, there's a lot of reasons why somebody just doesn't complete an order form. And so that was the most relevant traffic, just targeting people who land on the cart page, but don't end up buying. Yeah. I love when you talk about that. Cause again, it's one of those things that it's a head slap. It makes so much sense, but we just think about just putting it on the page and everyone gets it. Right. So yeah. You know, Justin, I, I, I tend to get to make all the mistakes for me. <laughs> Thank you for that, Justin. I appreciate that. Um, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, and we talked about some in the past, um, what's been the lowest moment and then how you pushed forward? <laughs> the lowest moment, uh, and if Jim Boykin sees this, he'll probably feel bad. I like to razz him about this, but... <clears throat> 2010-ish, you know, when I told you I forgot to start another business after I had sold my other one, um, it was tough because I was I had only ever sold information or marketed information as an affiliate, and so 2010 was this new era where information marketing just wasn't nearly was something people did as like blogging. It, it was their it was their traffic. It wasn't their sales anymore. Right. And so I was very lost, and but I had also done very well with SEO. I had over 200 first page rankings. I had written a wow. book on SEO that sold uh, thousands of copies, and I tried to get a job as an SEO with Jim Boykin, and he ended up giving me a hundred bucks and putting me on a taxi and saying no. So. Here I was at a place where I had maybe $3,000 left in my name. I had gone from criminal to success 
And now all of a sudden here I was again, like at the bottom. And then I was like, screw it. I guess I have to go get a job. I was like, well, let me go get a job doing SEO. That's something I know like the back of my hand. And I couldn't even get a job as doing that, you know? So I remember coming back home and uh, being very lost, being, you know, losing moments of time, kind of, you know, driving someplace and getting to the store and realizing I didn't remember anything between the driveway and the store, Hmm. you know? Um, So that was, that was a really low moment for me. Uh, But that, Turned into today. So. Yeah. So then on the flip side, Justin, what's been the proudest moment? And, you know, just a reflection on that. You know, the, the obviously the founders of Google were trying to sell the search engine and no one would buy it. Right. So. So look at that. Yeah. <laughs> so what's yeah. been one of the proudest moments? Proudest moments. Um been some good ones uh you know passing the seven figure mark you know on paper yeah uh that's huge so what do yeah, you need to celebrate huge. something it's like huge. that yeah, i kind of you know i i have a bad habit of always like looking ahead and yeah. not enjoying the successes that i've had in the past but i think all yeah. entrepreneurs deal with that yeah. uh so i you know i'm like well, it wasn't seven figures in my pocket, you know, but yeah, I, I, I broke the seven figures in one year mark for my, my own company. Mm-hmm. Um, I broke the hundred thousand clicks in one day, Mark. Wow. I have, uh, provided for my family. I have, um, you know, my wife starting her own business now is, is very, what is it? I'm loving that. Yeah. Uh, she's going to be my sugar mama pretty soon. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm just going to disappear from the internet. And uh, yeah. So what if you started? You know, and I, I, I like it all. You know, it's all been yeah. a fun ride. The, the ups, the downs. It's just who I am, yeah. man. I just all of it. Yeah. One thing Neil I Patel taught me that he's he, you know, not him, he himself, but I've followed Neil Patel since he was just a web designer. Yeah. And, um, you know, he had a message saying you have to learn to love the journey Yeah, because it's the journey. You know, you, the destination, yeah. you're never actually going to get there. It's you, you have to learn to love. You'll the, get there oh, and there'll be a new destination. Right. Yeah. There'll always be a new destination. You right. know, so it took me a long time to really understand what he meant by that. Yeah. But I love the whole part of it now. I like yeah. the ups. I like the downs. I wouldn't trade this for anything. Yeah. I have that written down here to the journey because you do talk about that. So what do you do now to enjoy the journey? Knowing an entrepreneur listening to this, it's it's easier said than done. It's tough to do because you're always looking for the next thing or, or what's next or what's bigger. What do you do to enjoy the journey? Uh, you know, it's kind of weird. It's kind of odd what I do. Yeah. You know, I kind of pretend like I'm in the Truman Show and everybody's watching my failures and my successes. And so... Whenever like something bad happens, I kind of end up laughing and I kind of get this cheesy announcer voice in my head of what is he going to do now, ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) he's back up against the wall. And I've failed so many times and I've failed so hard. I I don't know how to quit. I don't I don't know. I don't even know how to fail anymore. I just start over. Yeah. But one thing you do do, Justin, and because I was. You're chatting with Molly via email is, I mean, you just went on a long trip or didn't you go on like an RV trip or something that had yeah, to be, in, yeah, like, what did, on, yeah, that was cool. Yeah. I went on a 10 day RV trip. We've done a 90 day trip uh, with the family, I homeschooled my kid while we drove around the nation for 90 days. We just did one in an RV uh, for 10 days. I'm a, you know, literally, uh, you know, Across the room, there's a bunch of clothes and suitcases. We're heading up to the St. Lawrence River on Thursday. We're going to spend, you know, seven or eight days drinking beer and fishing with my cousins. Uh, 90% unplugged because I don't ever fully unplug. Uh, I know some people would give me some crap for that, but I enjoy being having access to the Internet. And, yeah. Um, yeah, that is part of enjoying the journey. So, I, you know, it's not just all sitting at the computer, but you are taking trips and you are seem to be enjoying life, uh, life as well. So I have, a, I have a, some questions from Molly, but before I ask Uh-oh. them, um, where can we point people towards what's, 
you know, where, where should people check out? Google for you. Google Justin Brooke. Yeah. Surprise yourself. You might find some. Yeah, you can Google Justin what's Brooke. Your most popular, what's your most popular uh, blog post or that the, people should The thing check? that everybody likes are my YouTube videos. I got over 100 videos on YouTube and we're. I keep teasing my subscribers and followers that I'm going to be making more, and I just uploaded one yesterday, so it's 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 absolutely coming. Um, but that's usually what people end up liking the most. There's two things. There's my weekly newsletter that I send out called Traffic Tips for Busy People. Mm-hmm. When I go to events, everybody always tells me, "Oh, I love your newsletter. It's the only one I actually read." Mm-hmm. Uh, and or they come up to me and say, "Oh, I love your YouTube videos." You know, so lots of value there. Yeah. So, what have we before we get to talk the Molly questions? What have we missed? What what didn't we talk about that you're like? Jared? I don't know, dude. It's been uh, an hour and fifty seven minutes. I don't think you missed anything. <laughs> so, I'm going to ask you the Molly questions. Um, she wants to know a couple of things. I had to include them in here. Okay. What do you secretly get excited about? Uh, what do I secretly get excited about? Um, bringing down the gurus, the the internet marketing. Uh, I I have a love hate relationship with the internet marketing is like a topic, right? You mm-hmm. know, it's 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 what a lot of us do. But then there's also the internet marketers, and there's kind of like a small circle on the internet of guys who sell courses and do product launches over and over again. Um, you know, that circle of the, the IMers, uh, I love, I love to beat up on those guys, but I also love that industry because that industry changed my life. Right. You know, it took me from like Wendy's to, uh, you know, really doing well in life. So, and that's kind of why I, I, I care so much. That's why I don't, just shut my mouth is because I believe so much that we really, you know, all these fortune 500 companies and the growth hackers and everybody right now, you know, they really owe these internet marketers a lot. You know, we taught them how to do this stuff. We taught them how to sell online. They have taken the ball and run with it and evolved on it, but they took a lot of what we invented and are now using it. And then, uh, calling us the yellow highlighter crowd and making fun of us, but we taught you how to do this stuff. Uh, but at the same time, there are some, uh, there is a lot of guys in this industry who do deserve the the scrutiny that the rest of the internet puts on them, mm-hmm. and that's what I love to beat up on in this industry. Right. People who are putting red borders on their ads and hypey headlines and doing product launches every two months instead of just selling the product. Um, yeah. So that's what I secretly so, get excited. Every time I can just dig it to those guys. So who's your hero? Legit person, she said. Legit who's person. My, who's my a legit hero? Legit person, yeah. Um, Frank McKinney. Uh, you know, Frank McKinney has... I believe he has... I don't know everything about him. Uh, he's, a, he's a real estate millionaire... Mm-hmm. Uh, he, I went uh, to Haiti with him. Hmm. We built some uh, houses. He, he runs a charity and uh, that builds houses in Haiti. And I went down there and I did that with him. And I believe that he has a past. I don't know. So I could be putting words in his mouth. But from what I've seen and heard, I feel like we have a similar storyline. And hmm. he has also made a lot of money and then realized that, you know, like, Okay, great. You know, now what? You know, what do I do with this money now? Yeah. And so he's got a lot to teach me right now. He's helping me get to the next level of how do I become a steward of this money and the success yeah. and this reputation that I've built and this audience that I built. How do I be a good steward to this th- yeah. thing that I have? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Justin, I greatly appreciate your time. And, you know, this is no joke. I probably could go on for another two hours, but I will, uh, because you said you have all day and I'm your last call. But um, I appreciate your time and thank you so much for sharing. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. What I got, you got.
get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a peach if you find the same And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand 